Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I'm Cody Goodwin here with Mike Rodak. We might see Alex Scarborough later in today's show. I know that he had an appointment that he had to take care of. If he pops in, we'll be sure to bring the three-man weave in. But hey, it's Thursday, another show, episode 110. Mike, how you holding up this week? It's been it's been kind of a busy and hectic one in terms of content and overall conversation, I think, surrounding the Alabama football program. I'm good. It's uh, busy is good, as they say. So I'm happy with it. The a, a younger version of me would have said busy is good because it helps keep me out of trouble. <laughs> so we got that going for us, at least. What's maybe before we dive into today's show, what's maybe been the most surprising, interesting? I don't know. There's been a lot of, I feel like, reaction and things that we've had to keep tabs on this week just in response to the continued fallout from the loss to Vanderbilt. And a lot of people have sounded off. We've gotten to talk to coaches and players about many different things. We got to talk to Malachi earlier this week. You got We got to talk to the assistant coaches. What's maybe been the most interesting thing that to you that has stuck out this week? Honestly, I think it's Kalen DeBoer's overall response. Um I think it's not necessarily well received by fans. I think starting from, and it's multifaceted. It started with the post game and, and there's so many different ways of processing it. And I think a lot of people have processed it different ways, but the Malachi Moore thing, I think people question him about that. But then overall the game itself, basically saying that, you know, the ball kind of bounced the other way and, Vanderbilt made more plays and they out executed Alabama and then saying that it it wasn't really a preparation issue saying that they did not take Vanderbilt for granted that they had a great week of practice that everything was fine basically they just went out there in the field and lost the game and then DeBoer kind of framing it as a game that you know could have gone differently if they had made a couple plays here and there which is true to some extent, but at the same time, like Vanderbilt from start to finish was beating you like that. They were clearly the better team that day. Uh, it wasn't fluky. It wasn't one thing here or there that completely changed the game to me. Like it was their ability to go right down the field and score touchdowns in the first quarter, second quarter, all the way. And then at the end, their ability to get those two first downs and kill the clock and end the game. So it wasn't just one thing. Look, I think there was games the last couple of years that either Alabama didn't play well in, so Florida, or that they lost Texas or Michigan, that, or even going back to Tennessee and LSU the year before, that people weren't happy with Nick Saban's response. So it's not necessarily a Saban versus DeBoer thing. It might be a Saban 10 years ago versus DeBoer thing where people want anger. They want accountability. They want punishment. They want discipline. They want all of these things that they felt like were staples of Nick Saban's height of success, which was, again, not the end of his career. It was probably a few years before that. All those things that they felt like were integral to how Alabama was, they want now. And it's not to say that those things should exist or that they should be replicated, but people seem on a general sense to want those things and they don't, they aren't necessarily getting them from Kalen DeBoer right now. You know, there's one person on our board that called it gaslighting. I, that might be a strong term, but I think it's, it, there is some element of like, everybody watched the game. Everybody saw that they got beat their response as fans or even their response as Heisman trophy winner, Mark Ingram or former Alabama player, Damian Harris, Greg McElroy, their response is not what Kalen DeVore's response is. And Kalen DeVore's response is a little bit more positive and optimistic, not as harsh. And people seem to want those. People seem to want something that's harsher and a little bit more urgent. So that's been the biggest thing to me is just kind of the dichotomy of how fans and 
former players are reacting versus how Kalen DeBoer is reacting. And it's not necessarily a case of right and wrong, but it is a case of different. And I think that is still significant. I understand why people want the fire. Like they love watching Saban rip into players and spout off at the microphone and whatever the case may be like that has led to some of the more memorable Nick Saban interviews or Nick Saban sound bites. And when you produce in the way that he did, I understand that that's why people are going to want that. But at the same time, I, I feel like this is also kind of the true, like, Hey, like, this is who this guy is. This guy being Kalen DeBoer, like he's going to be calm. He's going to be even keel. He's not going. And he even said this multiple times. Like the, the worst thing that you can do is overreact. You're not going to get emotional about these things. He's going to stay pretty calm and even keel on these things. And I, I feel like this is the first time that really a lot of people have gotten to see that up close in response to something adversity, I suppose. Right. Like, cause up, up until now, everything has been pretty smooth sailing, right? Like the, the transition retaining, much of the recruiting class, just the the transfer portal ads here and there, and, and even some of the losses, like he's just very steady, very even keel, not going to get too high, not going to get too low, right? And that was, that was even something that Saban preached a little bit for all of his fire that he would show on occasion. I feel like this is the first time that people are really truly, truly seeing that, which maybe speaks a little bit to some of the, you know, I guess response a little bit. And I don't know, like it's it's probably going to take a minute for the fan base, I think, to adjust to the fact that this is who this guy is like he's not going to he's not going to spaz out one way or the other. He's not going to hit the panic button. He might wind up and take some anger or frustration or whatever out on a referee for a missed pass interference call. But that when the final whistle blows and he's able to walk off and process it as quickly as he can before he comes and talks to us. He's going to calm back down. He's going to be pretty level headed. He's going to be pretty even keel. And I, that's, I, I think like I have found the response to everything to be interesting to say the least. We'll put it that way. I think it's going to take a minute and for, for, I guess the fan base to really kind of be like, okay, like this is just who this guy is. Like we need to quit clamoring for something that's not going to happen. Right. Yeah, I agree. It's, I don't think he's going to, change i don't think it would necessarily work for him to be try to be that sort of guy and you know look i think behind the scenes there's probably a little bit more stress on players and coaches this week that we may not be seeing from kaylin DeBoer, but i'm sure in that meeting room with his assistants he's letting them know you know what needed to be fixed so the point gets across it, you know, there's there's kind of the emotional aspect of it and the psychological aspect of how you respond to these things, but there's also the technical aspect. And if even if you come out remotivated and pissed off and, and all of that for the South Carolina game, if technically you still haven't fixed things on the field and South Carolina is still able to exploit things, then it's not really going to matter what your response is or what DeBoer's response is or whatever. Like there, there's two parts of it. So at the end of the day, if you get the the players to fix the technical stuff and you can get them in the right mindset. And look, I think players obviously like DeBoer. You know, we heard Jeremy Bernard on the radio show last night talking about how he always has their back. What did he say? I'm trying to find the quote right here. I think the biggest thing about Coach DeBoer is he always has his players back, and I'll always commend him for that. He always has an optimistic mindset. He never has doubt that we're going to have a great week of preparation. We're going to translate that on the field on Saturday. So, I think players like that. I think Malachi Moore certainly expressed appreciation for DeBoer's support. And he's a player's coach, probably more than Saban. And, you know, Saban was a player's coach, I think, in a different way. He had certain relationships with guys. But this is obviously different. And this is kind of how he gets through to them. And this game is a good test of, of how that works. And Obviously, the Tennessee game is going to be a good test of, of how this all works, too. I think these next two games are going to tell us a lot. And, you know, if you lose one of these next two, then, you know, I think the conversation gets louder um, coming out of that. Important stretch of games here for Alabama. We'll dive into Crimson Tide's matchup against South Carolina a little bit later in today's show. What I wanted to get to today, we've been kicking this can down the road for a few episodes now. We're six weeks in. Right. We, we have a pretty good idea of who's who and what's what, or at least we think we do at this point in the season, right? Early to mid October. 
the SEC standings, which is really what we're going to get into today, are starting to take a little bit of shape. Not a lot, but a little bit. And we're starting to maybe see some pathways here and there for teams to potentially contend for Atlanta, potentially contend for position or hierarchy within the conference that could play a role in the college football playoff. I wanted to start here. The the SEC standings going into this week, week seven. There are three teams that are still undefeated in conference play. Texas A&M, 5-1 and one overall, 3-0. and oh in conference number one ranked texas five and zero overall one and zero in conference and then lsu four and one overall one and zero in conference there's a bunch of teams with one loss but i think you start with georgia and arkansas who are both two and one in conference play and then you've got alabama florida missouri ole miss oklahoma tennessee and vanderbilt who are all one and one then you've got south carolina and kentucky who are both one and two and the mississippi state and auburn both still winless in conference play Mike, I know that you have made this comment on the board. You have made this comment on past shows. Texas A&M sitting at the top of the conference, especially after they housed a Missouri team that we thought would at least be dangerous this season. That really intrigues you, not just because of what they've done so far, but they seem to have a through line to Atlanta so long as they continue to take care of business. I don't know if you wanted to rehash what you said earlier on the show or what you posted on the board earlier this week, but that, that the Aggies team seems to, they're pretty well positioned, I think, to make a run. And, and you were the first one to point this out. So I'll cede the floor to you. Yeah, I guess it's a consequence or a benefit, no matter you know how you want to look at it, of the SEC's new scheduling format for at least this year or next year, where it's kind of made up by the conference. There's not necessarily a formula to it. Uh, I know they looked at like 10 year success rates and, and some of that, and they tried to keep certain rivalries, but it was kind of a hand picked group of teams for each team to put the schedule together for these two years. And I think they're going to come up with something a little bit more permanent starting in 2026 if they go to nine games, which I think a lot of people would like them to. So AM schedule has Texas, which is, number one in the country, but they have them at home the last week of the season. That's a gigantic rivalry game, a rivalry renewed, if you will. And that's really their hardest game remaining. Otherwise, A&M sitting at 3-0 and goes to Mississippi State. They go to South Carolina. They go to Auburn. And then they have a home game, or really before that, they have a home game against LSU, which is their second toughest game to Texas, but it's at home. And Kyle Field can be a tough place to play. So, Let's say AM splits those LSU and Texas games. Let's say they win the three games on the road that they should, which is not a given, but I think they should win those games. If anybody has watched Auburn this year, they should win that game. It's at Jordan Hare. We got to preface that, but right. yeah, point well. But taken. Jordan Hare is different if it's not an Alabama game. Just ask Diego Papia <laughs> in New Mexico State. Um, you know, South Carolina is probably beatable. That might be their toughest of those three. Mississippi State is certainly beatable in Starkville. So if AM can take care of business in the games that they're favored, and they could be favored at home against LSU, then they really only have to split those two games against Texas and LSU. They could still lose to Texas, be 7-1 and one in the SEC, and I think they'd be right there and start looking at tiebreakers to go to Atlanta. Um, let's say Texas runs the table, which would, you know, be doable, not necessarily guaranteed for them. They still have to play Georgia at home. They would still have to play a m at a and m But if a and m go if Texas goes eight and oh, a and m goes seven and one, I don't know if you have another seven and one team. I mean, Alabama could be it if they get through Tennessee and LSU. Tennessee would have to get through Alabama and Georgia. Old Miss would have to get through Georgia. They play LSU this week too. So and they play LSU. So you're looking at a potential situation where that Georgia, Ole Miss, Tennessee, they all kind of beat up on one another, especially if there's kind of varied results. And then you might just have a seven and one AM sitting there, and their only loss would be a good loss to Texas. And you'd have to look exactly how the tiebreakers would work, but there's a very good chance, or at least a chance, that they would be going and playing Atlanta, uh, playing Texas in Atlanta the week after they just played them in College Station. That could happen with this new format. So and, and look, I don't know how much effect this would have on the playoff. I think the whole idea of eliminating divisions was they wanted to keep the second best team from being something fluky in your conference and then going and winning the conference championship and then missing the playoff. Uh, they wanted to prevent some of that. And they also wanted to 
create more inter division, you know, matchups and, and get places, get people to places that haven't been to yet. But that still might happen because of the unbalanced schedules. You still might have an A and M, which is probably not the second te best team in the SEC going to the SEC championship game. And then let's say they have two losses. Let's say they lost to Notre Dame in the first game. They lost to Texas in their last game of the regular season. They go to Atlanta as a two loss team. Let's say they lose to Texas again. Then you have a three loss A and M team that's probably out of the playoff, which is tough for the team that's losing the conference championship. And I'd played a extra game, a 13th game to take a third loss and be out of the playoff. But you start comparing like Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee to them, like the committee would probably think that those teams are better. So it's going to be interesting how this all works. Um, but then if A and M wins, let's say they go to Atlanta and they beat Texas, then they have a top four seed in the playoff. So it's as a two loss team, even like, so it's, it's interesting how this is all going to work out. And, you know, right now I'd say LSU Ole Miss is a very important game as far as the playoff is concerned, because LSU already has that one loss they took to USC, but they're undefeated uh, with one SEC game so far, South Carolina. I mean, if they get past Ole Miss, then all they would have is A&M, Alabama and Oklahoma. If they can take two out of those three, then LSU is in a pretty good spot too, which I don't think a lot of people would have thought. So this is fun. Like, I, look, I enjoy this. <laughs> this is this is different than what it's been in the past. Like, you Alabama gets through a certain amount of SEC West games, and you're like, as long as they don't screw it up in the Iron Bowl, they're in. And like, this is a totally different formula now. Now, hell, like Alabama could do the same thing. They could win against Tennessee. They can win against LSU, and they could th theoretically screw up in the Iron Bowl, and it could be a bad loss. But there's just so many more variables. Because you don't have – like it used to just be division record – or sorry, it was SEC record that decided what your standing was in the division. But the tiebreakers were against SEC West teams. Now it's it's just wide open, and it doesn't really matter who you play. So, you know, a loss to Vanderbilt's going to count just as bad as, you know, a loss to Georgia would have. So – or, you know, a loss to Tennessee or a loss to Auburn would have. Like it's all the same now. So – I think Georgia's in a tough spot, even with, you know, a close loss to Alabama. Like, they still have to get through Tennessee. They still have to get through Ole Miss, and they still have to get through Texas. That's a tough spot for Georgia. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I think Ole Miss is in a, a tight spot as well, having taken that loss to Kentucky. They still have to play Georgia. I think if they if they lose to LSU, then Ole Miss is is really in dire straits. They would have to beat Georgia to have a, a good shot at the playoff. Look, I going back to AM for a second, like I think a healthy Connor Wegman, 81% passing the other day against Missouri, 276 yards. Like he looked really good. Yeah. Like that's one of the better quarterbacks in the SEC when he's healthy and they're going. So I would not overlook AM. I think LSU still everything's still in front of them, as people like to say. You know, Alabama's schedule is not looking as hard as it once did because Missouri doesn't look as good. <clears throat> Oklahoma doesn't look as good. You know, I think the LSU game in Baton Rouge is still pretty tough, but, you know, it's the Tennessee game that is really going to decide some things for Alabama. Looking at the, the the teams that are undefeated, you obviously did a good job breaking down A&M. Texas and LSU both still want to know, kind of touched on them a little bit. LSU still has to play Ole Miss. A&M, Alabama, they end with Oklahoma. Texas has Red River this weekend. Georgia next weekend. They end with A&M. Texas and LSU, if you had to pick right now, which schedule, I guess, do you like in terms of one of those teams making an honest run in the game? I mean, I, I would say of those two, I would like Texas's chances better because I think they're the better team, um, even though I think their schedule is harder. You know, having to play Georgia – and then at a and M, I I still think they're a better team than LSU, but I think LSU's path might be a little bit easier. It depends on this Ole Miss game. If they get past the Ole Miss game, I like LSU's chances. If they lose to Ole Miss, I don't like LSU's chances. So that's why I think this is <laughs> an important game this week. Because after that, you'd have to go to a and still for LSU. You'd have to play Alabama at home. Like, Yeah, I'll go with Texas. Of those two teams, I would feel much better about Texas. Of these one-loss teams, Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, Tennessee, 
I think we'll throw Mizzou in there right now just because I think their last big remaining SEC test is is in Tuscaloosa. So there's still an opportunity there if they can somehow get the offense together and make a little bit of a run here and at least throw a couple wrenches in there. I, I guess what intrigues you maybe about that cluster of teams? Most of them still have to play one another. Obviously, we saw the Alabama-Georgia result. Alabama misses Ole Miss, but has Mizzou, Tennessee. Like, what's I, what? What intrigues you? I guess about some of those one-loss teams. A lot, but yeah, I, I think if Mizzou takes a loss to Alabama, I think they're done as far as the playoff is, is concerned. Even as a two-loss team, I think their schedule just doesn't lend itself to getting in as a two-loss team with losses at A and M and Alabama, which would still, you know, those are tough losses on the road, but they don't have enough. Don Conference and, and otherwise to really There's not a lot of opportunities for big wins for them. Right. Yeah. So I think Mizzou taking a second loss in a couple of weeks to Alabama would be lethal to them. Yeah, you raised a good point before about Tennessee you being in a tough spot because you know you take a bad loss to Arkansas and then if you don't beat Alabama, you still have Georgia on your schedule. So right. I think Tennessee's at the very least has to split those Georgia and Alabama games. And, you know, that's a team that's not looking quite as strong now as they did two or three weeks ago. So they intrigue me. I mean, Ole Miss, just such a stupid loss to take at home against Kentucky that they should have won that game. You know, Trey Harris fumbling the ball in the red zone, like just found a way to mess it up. And that's a team that doesn't hasn't really done that a whole lot. Like their losses are typically to Alabama and Georgia. And that's. Yeah. What you kind of figured this year is like they could beat everybody, but how do they do against Georgia? And now they're in a position where they have to beat Georgia. I think if they don't beat Georgia, they're in a tough spot as far as the playoffs. So when all is said and done, like LSU and AM probably come out in a better position than some of you know Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee and Ole Miss and Texas, you know, I think would be obviously in a good spot as well. There's not going to be six SEC teams in the playoff to me. I think five is probably the the more likely number. And of those five, if you ask me today on October 10th, you know, who's going to be in the playoff, I would say Texas, Texas A&M, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia. I was going to say, I was like, I haven't heard Georgia yet. Come out of your mouth. Right. What are you thinking? <laughs> Georgia has the toughest path. Georgia of all those teams has the toughest path right now. You take the loss at Alabama, you still have Ole Miss, you still have Texas, and you still have Tennessee. That's tough. And two of uh, those three are on the road. Like they are right. at Texas next week. They are at Ole Miss in early November. They get to host Tennessee. So that, you know, mm -hmm. you've got that going for you. So you you almost have to split Texas Ole Miss to maintain, you know, what would be on pace for 10 and two. And I think at that point it'd be what, six and two in, in the SEC. And you might miss Atlanta, but depending on how the rest of the country shakes out, you might host a first round game or right. you know, you're in that eight, nine matchup where you're on the road. If there's a team that can make it with three losses, I think Georgia would be it. Georgia could lose two more games, two of those three, and still be stacked up against Penn State. Might be even ahead of them. Like, a, what team would be kind of right there? The first thought that came to mind, and this is going to be a little, a little out there, but like, if Indiana continues winning mm -hmm. and they're ten and two, but you've got ten and two Indiana, who I don't know that they've beaten anybody of note i'm trying to pull up their schedule while we're talking this right now but then you've also got nine and three georgia or ten and three if they slip into atlanta and win or lose that game mm -hmm. that i that could be if i guess if they win in atlanta they're in automatically but i don't know that that could be an interesting thing too. i think a two loss clemson team that lost to miami and lost to georgia and then you have a head-to-head -head where georgia has three losses clemson has two but you could say georgia kicked clemson's ass like that's where i think georgia might get in as a three loss team over somebody like that um, because of they can point to how hard their schedule is and they will be right. And I think that will be a good test of the the playoff committee and, and how they view strength of schedule versus just number of losses and how they view sec teams versus your second best big 12 or second best ACC team. I think there's going to be fans of those other conferences that will be mad, but at the end of the day, Georgia being, still a really good team even with potentially three losses like i think they would still be a playoff team like i think that's you asked me like are they one of the 12 best teams in the country i would still probably say yes so that's going to be a good test of how this all works and but you know look if georgia gets their stuff together 
what if they beat Texas, Tennessee, and Ole Miss? Then you're looking at a one-loss Georgia team that damn near beat Atlanta. them on the road. Yeah. Then you're going to Atlanta in that case, or potentially going to Atlanta. I, the tiebreaker between a one-loss Georgia that lost to Alabama on the road and a one-loss Texas A&M that lost to Texas at home, I would have to look at how that tiebreaker would work out. Well, and in that in that specific scenario, you could, in theory, have a one-loss Texas team right. as well. Who right. would have the head to head over AM, but then they would lose to Georgia. So how would you solve that? And you might have a one loss team somewhere else too. Yeah, um, I mean Tennessee and Alabama are still kind of lingering out there. Right. So the tiebreaker, it's it's too much of a Rubik's cube to figure out right now. But if if it was just Georgia versus AM and AM got to Atlanta instead of Georgia, Georgia fans would lose their mind. But at the same time, like I think they would still be in a really good spot. Even if Georgia finishes third in the SEC, they have one loss. They don't make Atlanta because of the stupid tiebreakers in their mind. They would still probably be the number five seed. Yeah, they'd be hosting a first round playoff. You'd have a yeah, you'd have a bye week instead of having to drive down the street to Atlanta and play an extra game, and that might end up being a good thing for them. Here's the 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 thought now that I've pulled up Indiana's schedule. Indiana, there's a there's a potential here for them to they're six and zero right now. If they could go ten and two with losses to Michigan or Ohio State, because those are the really the only two big name teams left on their schedule. They still host Nebraska. They got to play Purdue and Washington and we'll see, but Michigan, Ohio state. So let's say they go 10 and two and Georgia goes nine and three. Do you, do you slip in Indiana at the 11 seed or, or do you plug in nine and three Georgia? That's that, that would be a very interesting conundrum. I think we'd all pick Georgia. That might be sec bias, but yeah, no, I, I probably would too. And, I mean, I don't know. It's an interesting, like, what is the, people you know, hate like all these weekly CFP rankings. Like, I think this stuff is great. I love these scenarios. I love these comparisons. I think it it's part of what makes late November, early December fun in college football is figuring out, you know, what's going to happen and what could happen. It's watching all of these games with the knowledge that one play could change a lot of things. That's what makes it fun. And yeah, an Indiana versus Georgia comparison. I mean, hell, Georgia going to Indiana in December to decide that if they're both in the playoff, like <laughs> that would be up fun. for it. That's fun. I'm I'm looking forward to that. That would be that would be fun. Last question before we pivot to Alabama, South Carolina. Of the one loss teams that maybe we think less of, I suppose is the way to phrase it. Teams like Arkansas, Florida, Oklahoma, Vanderbilt. Is there a team there that you would maybe assign the the dark horse team worth watching over the next month or so to kind of see where they're at by mid-November? Or is there a team of that group that intrigues you? I mean, (laughs) don't make me say it. Don't make me say it. But say it. No, I don't want to say it. It's not Vanderbilt. Look, (laughs) Vanderbilt has to go to Kentucky. They have to play Texas. They have to go to Auburn play South Carolina at home, they have to go to LSU, and they have to play Tennessee at home. Like, if Vanderbilt goes 4-1 and one in that stretch and is sitting with two losses in the SEC by the end of this season, like, I will show up on the show naked. Like, I will <laughs> – I will do something because I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think there's a possibility. So, they – let's – I think they can beat Kentucky. We'll see. I don't know. Deion Walker's a beast. Win over Ball State, whatever. Lose to Texas, but then if you beat Auburn and South Carolina, you're sitting there at two losses with two weeks left. And yeah, you have LSU and Tennessee though. At LSU. Right. Well, you you maybe like at that point, two losses probably takes you out of it. Yeah, I don't know that they're beating both LSU and Tennessee, but like if they they could play the role of spoiler, maybe. Like I before we hit record, I was like, I was what if Vanderbilt knocks off Tennessee to kick Tennessee out of Atlanta slash potentially the playoff? Like that's that's a possibility. I think the best chance is that Vanderbilt finishes five and three in the SEC. I think probably more likely four and four. And I think that's a really good season for him. Don't tell that to Diego Pavia because he has national championship aspirations, but that's kind of what I would expect with them. I don't really see Arkansas. I think Arkansas, you know, still has to play LSU, still has to play Ole Miss, still has to play Texas, still has to go to Missouri. I don't like them as a one loss team at all. They do have they do get LSU and Ole Miss and Texas all at home. Like right. I if I'm any of those teams, especially after what they did to Tennessee, I am I'm not taking the hogs lightly. I just I don't see it with Arkansas enough. You know, I Missouri, if they get past Alabama, then yes, like 
Como will be on fire. But if they lose to Alabama, like I said, I think they're done. Florida's one lost team is funny. Um, I don't think that's going anywhere. Shout out to Billy for surviving. Look, I think Oklahoma is a weird, weird team. Quarterback play is not there. Yeah, they're three and one. The defense is going to keep them in a lot of games. So if they can figure out a couple things on offense, they will give themselves opportunities. We're going to be talking about Oklahoma if they somehow beat Texas this weekend. Because then after that, it's South Carolina, Ole Miss. Missouri, Alabama, LSU. Damn, I, I every they team have you look to go at, two like, Ole Miss, two right. Missouri, and two LSU. Like those road games are nasty. Right. Yeah. I, it's not Oklahoma either. So I don't think it's of the one loss teams. I don't think Vanderbilt. I don't love their schedule. I don't love Oklahoma's schedule. I don't love Ole Miss's schedule. I don't think Florida's any good. I don't like Georgia's schedule, but I think they're good. I don't really like Arkansas, but their schedule's all right. Alabama's schedule. In their team, that combination is is good. Like I, I, I would still like where they stand. Missouri's schedule is not bad, but th- their opportunities for good wins are also not really there. And if they don't look good at all against Alabama, then it's just the feeling. I still like Tennessee. Like I still think they have what it takes. I think that Arkansas game was a little bit fluky. Uh, yeah, they came back at the end. It was Just, it was the freshman game from Nico. Like let's he was right. on the road, SEC environment, an Arkansas team that is mostly competent, maybe not super dangerous, but that's a team that knows what they're doing. And they took advantage of a kid playing in a rowdy environment. And I don't want to say he was shook a little bit, but like, you know, you and I were watching the last play of that final drive there. Like, throw the ball to the end zone, kid. Give yourself a chance. Right. And look at Tennessee's. Upcoming schedule, Florida at home, Alabama at home, Kentucky at home, Mississippi State at home. That's four actually straight home games. Yeah, four straight home games. So if Al- if, t- if Tennessee beats Alabama, they're in really good shape. They yeah. could even go to Georgia and lose. And then after that, they have UTEP at home and they play Vandy in Nashville. So unless Diego Pavia wants to play spoiler of all spoilers, I think a Tennessee team with two losses to Georgia and at – at Georgia and at Arkansas would still be in a really good position for the playoff with a win over Alabama in hand. I think an Alabama team that has a loss at Vanderbilt and a loss at Tennessee all of a sudden is looking for a, another big win. You know, I think you obviously would have to go to LSU and win. I think you'd have to, you know, really show something against Missouri, really show something against Oklahoma, really show something against Auburn. And, you know, you're still in a pretty good spot for the playoff with those two losses, but I don't think it's as strong of a resume because everybody saw the second half against Georgia. Everybody saw what happened in Vanderbilt. I'm going to drop a pin in this conversation. We'll circle back in a month to see how things shook out, to see if A&M truly positioned themselves potentially for Atlanta slash the college football playoff. A lot of interesting games still left on the schedule for the SEC. A lot of ball left to be played. Alabama hosts South Carolina this Saturday, 11 a.m. Central. Brian Denny Stadium, believe the game, is on ABC. Ran the college football 25 sim this morning. We're recording on Thursday. Alabama wins this game going away, 34-17. to There were seven total turnovers in the sim, Mike. It was really ugly. At one point in the first half, there were four consecutive possessions where they just traded interceptions. It was just a really weird game. That said, Alabama never really lost control of this game. They let it, well, I guess they were down 3-0 and then they jumped ahead to lead 17-3 at halftime and then ultimately pulled away. And that I think would be a, outside of the turnovers, that would be probably a welcome result given what happened last week in Nashville. Just a comfortable win over a lesser opponent. As you think about this matchup, Mike, what specifically, if anything, do you want to see from Alabama on Saturday? I mean, I think Kalen DeBoer is right in that each game is going to present different matchup issues. And I think all the things that we're talking about coming off of the Vandy game aren't necessarily going to be the things that we might need to look at or worry about in this game. You know, one of the first things that Chris Kabilovic talked about was the defensive ends of South Carolina and their overall pass rush. That's something I think DeBoer mentioned as well. Stewart and Kennard are, you know, really good defensive ends for for South Carolina. And then you look at Alabama's freak man, right? You look at Alabama's offensive line, and they've been better this year. It was only 
three or four weeks ago, we were talking about how dire the tackle situation looked. So in, you know, the Pritchett play was kind of an underrated aspect of that Mandy game too. You know, everybody talks about the defense, but that offense was driving down the field and had a chance to score there. So that matchup would intrigue me, you know, the defensive ends versus Alabama's tackles, just kind of overall, like how the offense functions. If, if there is some pressure, um, you know, how the offense is able to run the ball because that has not been consistently there this season. You know, I think defensively, you're not worried about the triple option. You're probably worried about sellers running a little bit. You know, Ole Miss contained them pretty well. 15 carries, 55 yards, like did have a 30 yarder. 20 of 32 passing for 162 yards, one interception. Like wasn't very effective by sellers as a passer. And and old Miss's offense, I think, put up some pretty big numbers, you know, against that South Carolina defense. So I think that's where you win the game is probably Milrow having another really good game as a passer, which I thought he did against Vandy outside of the the interception. So like that's to me how you win the game. But if you told me that Rocket Sanders runs wild and South Carolina has three or four sacks of Milrow because the offensive line is breaking down, like would I be totally shocked? No. Like I think this is still a, a competitive enough opponent that like you can't sit here and say it's it's going to be over um, from the first snap. I think the, the the matchups here I think are super interesting. You mentioned the defensive ends. One, I'd, li- I'd like to see Alabama's offensive tackles handle them. And if they struggle, I'd like to see the offense adjust to give them some help early, right? Like I think this could be a pretty big tight end game or Robbie Oots game in terms of helping with chip blocks or double teams or, or whatever the case may be. South Carolina's got a sneaky good run defense as well. I think they're top, what, 25 nationally, I think overall in run defense. So as much as I would like to see the running backs, I would like for this game to be the running back game to see Jam and Justice really kind of take over and be that dual threat rushing attack that we have thought of them to be, but just maybe haven't seen it yet. South Carolina's pretty good. I th- again, I think that's part of the defensive end, so maybe they can get some push up the middle. I'm not 100% sure. I think the other thing, too, that I, I would like to see in this game, South Carolina's not going to run the, the the pistol option offense that Vandy ran, but there are some elements that I think South Carolina is going to see from that tape. Like Lenora Sellers is not quite, I think, the athlete that Diego Pavia is. That's a very weird sentence to say, but that's what we know of it as so far, but he's a willing runner, right? Like he's second on the team in rushing behind Rocket Sanders. I think there are some things that South Carolina can do to make life difficult on Alabama's defense. I'd like to see them adjust to those things at all, but also maybe faster than what they did against Vanderbilt. Like if you've got Sellers, who's a willing runner, you've got Rocket Sanders, who is a good running back against a defense that has struggled to stop the run and also struggled to contain quarterbacks that are willing to run slash comfortable creating out of structure. I'm not sure that Sellers is super comfortable creative out of structure, but like he's a guy that you can get out on the edge and on the perimeter. I'd li- I'd like to see Alabama's defense shut that down, right? Like, and if if they can do that, I think they can win this convincingly, like the Sim suggested. But it's one of those things where after last week and really after what we've seen the last few weeks from the defense, I gotta see it, man. Like I gotta I gotta see them do this before I believe that they can do this because there's a lot of doubt right now. I think about this defense, and I don't know. Like it's it's one of those things where I'm gonna feel better when I see them actually do it and accomplish the thing that they need to do to win this game. And I I don't know that South Carolina is as dangerous as Vanderbilt in that way, but they will present some problems that I think will test the defense. Similar similar to how like early in the year we were talking about those first three games, we're gonna offer different types of stress tests. I think Sellers and Sanders could potentially offer the same idea of a stress test, just maybe on the ground a little bit more for Alabama's defense. And I'd like to see them nip that in the bud. At the end of the day, it's still one of those games that no matter what Alabama does, even if they win by 30 points, people are still going to walk into the game in Knoxville and just not know what's going to happen. I think you obviously give yourself more optimism and confidence and everything is kind of good vibes to some extent if you are able to have a convincing win over South Carolina. But I don't know how much that carries over or, or guarantees anything against Tennessee. If you don't play as well against South Carolina and still win, there's going to be, I think, some increased level of questions against Tennessee. If you lose to South Carolina, then we have bigger problems. <laughs> <laughs> Our website servers will crash at approximately three o'clock on Saturday afternoon and we'll be 
skipping dinner on Saturday night. So <laughs> that will be uh, that will be something. So would be something. I, I don't say will be something. It would be something. Conditional tense. So look, I, it's I want to say it's a no win situation for Alabama, but like it, it's one of those games that they can show you something, but like everybody's still going to be thinking about what happens next week in Tennessee. Some of the other elements that I like to see in this game, just come out, start fast, come out and punch them in the mouth. You were supposed to do that against Vanderbilt. You did not do it against South Carolina. You're back at the friendly confines of Saban field. Take advantage of that. I don't know. Like that's just, you know, some of these little things that we didn't see last week. I'd like to see it again this week. You do make a good point that even if they win 50 to nothing, it's like, well, Tennessee's up next. Like, on the road, the last time they went to the Volunteer State and played a football game, it did not go very well. So the last time they went to Newland Stadium and played a football game, it did not go very well. Right. So you're going to have all these things that are just lingering over them, regardless of of what you do on Saturday. So just go in and take care of business, and then and then worry about Tennessee. That is personally what I would like to see. But yeah, we'll be back Sunday recap the game. In the meantime, though, be sure to rate and review this show wherever you get your podcasts: Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama Two Four Seven YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. It's been a wild start to the month of October. We don't want you guys to miss a thing. So come along and enjoy the ride with us. As always, we appreciate you guys for listening. We'll talk to you all again soon.